Hello everyone, in this video I am going to tell you about silicon, which can definitely be called the smartest element on earth, because no calculations that modern day devices do would have been possible without this metalloid. This may come as a surprise, but there is an abundance of silicon on our planet. This is the second most abundant element after oxygen. However, it is incredibly challenging to find pure silicon in nature because of its property to form strong chemical bonds with oxygen, forming such a mineral as quartz and also other silicate minerals. Pure quartz crystals, which are made of silicon dioxide, have beautiful regular geometric shapes and have one interesting property called triboluminescence. If to rub two quartz crystals against each other, you can see very faint light where the minerals contact, which is the result of the formation of the crystalline grid of quartz crystals. The generated energy is released as heat and light. Quartz crystals also have a property called piezoelectricity, which you can observe every time you use a piezo ignition lighter. When a spring-loaded hammer hits a quartz crystal, it causes electric potential difference, which is released as a spark. If there is iron, manganese or other transition metal impurity in quartz crystal, such a violet mineral will be called amethyst. Quartz which contain water are known as another rare mineral, opal. Such stones, however, are not found everywhere. In contrast to extremely abundant sand, which can be found practically anywhere in the world. Sand, as I guess you understand, is also made up of silicon dioxide. Roughly half percent of iron oxide sand is made up of gives it its distinctive yellowish hue because of the very strong chemical bonds between silicon and oxygen. Sand as well as other quartz minerals is very chemically inert material and it is extremely challenging to extract something from it chemically. That is the very reason why pure silicon was obtained for the first time only in 1923 by reducing potassium fluorosilicate with molten potassium metal. I'll also try to obtain amorphous silicon, but I'm going to resort to another method. I'm going to mix one tenth of a mole of magnesium and five hundredth of a mole of fine sand. First, I decided to run this reaction in a glass tube. However, because of the rapid heating up of the mixture, the glass cracked and its content poured out. Do not try this at home. When I heated up the mixture for the second time, it went much better and the content didn't pour out. In this reaction, metallic magnesium reduces silicon dioxide to silicon, forming so-called amorphous silicon, which looks like a black sponge. This is not a very effective reaction of extracting amorphous silicon, because the product obtained as a result of the reaction can be contaminated by magnesium silicide. Besides, magnesium is very flammable in air. If we run the same reaction, but use twice as much magnesium, we will get magnesium silicide as a result of such a violent reaction between sand and magnesium powder. What noteworthy about this substance is that when it reacts with a 10% of sulfuric acid, the reaction produces a pyrophoric gas silane, which self-ignites when it reacts with air. However, this primitive reaction between sand and magnesium is not used to obtain amorphous silicon. Instead, scientists use a reaction between such a mineral as quartz and coke in special furnaces. The reaction produces pure silicon. However, oftentimes it is not pure enough to be used for making silicon chips and in the semiconductor's production. In order to obtain even more pure silicon, Scientists chlorinate the scrap silicon, which is later reduced with zinc. Such silicon is still not fitting for processors and solar panels yet. However, it can be used for a few experiments, which show its chemical properties. This metalloid is quite resistant to oxidation in air. A piece of silicon doesn't tarnish and doesn't change even when it is heated up by a burner. Its chemical properties 
are more similar to those of boron. However, crystalline silicon can react with a hot alkali solution, exhibiting properties of transition metals, for instance, of such a metal as aluminium. This reaction produces sodium metasilicate and hydrogen. If we run the same reaction, but this time with molten sodium hydroxide, the reaction will be much more violent and produce same products. There is yet another way to purify the obtained silicon. I am using a silicon powder and grind it even more in a mortar. Now I am mixing it with magnesium powder. Then I am going to heat up this mixture in a test tube. The silicon begins to react with magnesium, producing magnesium silicide of higher quality than the reaction between magnesium and sand does. If we add the obtained chemical to a 10% sulfuric acid solution, the reaction will produce quite a large amount of pyrophoric gas silane and even more other silicon hydrogen compounds. When the silane bubbles react with oxygen, they immediately explode and burn down in air, producing water and silicon dioxide. It is worthy of note that the reaction between silane and oxygen is so stable that it can be run at the temperature of liquid oxygen that is at minus 180 degrees Celsius. If I run this reaction in an inert atmosphere and could collect the obtained silane, I would use it for producing high pure silicon. When silane is heated to more than 500 degrees Celsius in an inert atmosphere, it breaks down into hydrogen and pure silicon which is pure enough to be used in the silicon semiconductors production. You can see such silicon on the screen. You can also see well that silicon has a polycrystalline structure, which means that it consists of lots of crystals, which are fused together. Such silicon is not fitting for making processors, but it can be used in the production of new polycrystalline solar cells. The thing is, that pure silicon is a semiconductor. This means that electrical resistance can decrease as the temperature grows. If we assemble a circuit with a silicon crystal and connect a small lamp, it will glow quite faintly at room temperature. If we heat a silicon crystal in this circuit, the lamp will glow much brighter because of the significant decrease in the silicon resistance at the higher temperature. This proves that it has semiconductor properties. In case with regular conductors, their resistance drops as the temperature rises. Because of its semiconductor properties, when phosphorus is added to the silicon, it becomes a semiconductor with excess p-type electrons. And if there are boron atoms in the crystalline grid, so-called holes, that is areas lacking electrons will form there. There is a so-called depletion zone in between them. Excess electrons can jump to where they are needed through this zone, having overcome the minimum voltage, which is a result of the depletion zone width. Thus we can make a simple semiconductor device, which is diode. But current won't flow in the opposite direction because of the electrostatic force. Solar panels have a similar design, but the upper layer of the n-type silicon is thinner in order to make it possible for light photons to travel through it. When the upper n-type layer absorbs an electron, the depletion zone releases one electron and the back electrical contact pushes it back out again. Thus voltage is produced. The lower part of the solar cell is an A-node and the upper is an cathode. This is how a solar panel works. Besides polycrystalline solar cells, there exists another older type of solar cells, which is monocrystalline. To make them, however, single crystals of silicon have to be grown. It is done using the so-called Chokhrasky process. A seed crystal's rod is dipped into the molten silicon and slowly pulled upwards being covered in a new layers, thus turning into a large single silicon crystal, 
which as well have organized crystalline grid. Such a method of growing crystals resembles home experiments of growing single crystal of salt solution, but in case with silicon everything looks far more serious. Then such a giant crystal is sliced into small segments and then they are coated with oxide layers and hundreds of microtransistors and PN junctions are transferred into them. Later such segments with already made chips are soldered to a plates, processor for smartphones and computers are ready. If to pull off such a silicon chip of its plate, polish it, then on the opposite side of it, with the help of a microscope, you will be able to see how the microtransistors are arranged. By the way, chips are multicolored because of the different thickness of the silicon oxide layer, which causes interference of light. Nowadays, almost all electronic devices run on silicon semiconductors, because old-fashioned germanium semiconductors are extremely rare these days. However, even through silicon compounds have high technology applications, remarkably, they can also be found practically everywhere. They are used in the production of alumisilicate building materials, porcelain, glass, etc. As a matter of fact, the houses we live in are about 40% of silicon minerals. Some of the hardest materials on Earth are made of silicon compounds such as silicon nitride and silicon carbide. They are used to make very hard ceramics, which can withstand high temperatures. According to Moore's scale, the hardness of silicon carbide is 9.5. That is why it easily scratches glass, and even such a hard glass as Gorilla Glass 4, on your smartphone. Such ceramics is used in composite material bulletproof vests. When a bullet hits such a ceramics, it shatters into numerous bits, which are then engulfed by the other two layers of bulletproof vest. Also silicon carbide is used to make abrasive discs for angle grinders. Beside in recent times, synthetic mosanite and silicon carbide crystals have been used more and more, of generally as a cheaper substitute for diamonds. Their refractive index and hardness is almost exactly the same as that of diamonds. That is why, theoretically speaking, there is no point of buying extremely expensive diamonds anymore. It is a lot easier to synthesize mosanite crystals. Also, the glass we have also got used to is made by fusing together fine sand and sodium carbonate. Sand or silicon dioxide content in glass from 60 to 96 percent. Besides, nowadays pure silicon sphere weighing roughly 1 kilogram and costing about 1 million euros could have become a new kilogram standard in 21st century. This sphere is entirely made of silicon 28 isotope. The number of atoms in this sphere is very precise. However, in the end of 2018, it was decided to define 1 kilogram by the Planck's constant. Of course, the importance of such a material as silicone should never be underestimated. Without this wonderful polymer, some women would not be able to achieve great shapes and success. From a chemical point of view, silicon is a long chain of a polymer molecules, which consist of organosilicon chain links. Viscosity and properties of silicon polymers depend on the length of molecules and the degree of their binding inside the material. For instance, nowadays silicon tubes are often used in chemistry experiments or, du or durable materials. However, when exposed to higher temperatures, silicon tubes as well as other silicons can burn in air forming a regular silicon dioxide as a waste material. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and also support channel on Patreon. I'm also thankful to all of my patrons who have supported the production of science videos on this channel.